Hello everyone, today we talk once again about the autonomistic tendencies in the post-Carolingian or late Carolingian kingdoms. So <coughs> this is a topic I already um, addressed uh, actually several times now. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's as if I was a bit um, obsessed by this. Um, I've made, uh, I think, enough videos you can find grouped into either uh, medieval society or into the Car Carolingian Europe playlist. So um, they brought into this um, wider frame of the mm, process of political fragmentation of um, of Carolingian and post Carolingian Europe. That is this f extremely important phase and. Uh, according to me, extremely overlooked phase of, of, of European, of the European Middle Ages. Um, it's important for, for many reasons, uh, really, because if you want really to understand the lower Middle Ages, you can't uh, but pass through that. Um, it's really, uh, the more I, I, I read about this mm, phase and the more I realize how really um, it informed, uh, even sort of genetically speaking, uh, European politics afterwards because what was set there from a political and social point of view passed with, with all obviously the changes that occurred but it, it had a, a direct effect substantially up to the beginning of the 20th century hmm, with the end of the ancien regime proper with the uh, with, with the fall of the eastern let's say central and eastern european empires that were a bit the the they had a bit the, the legacy of of of, of those um, of those, mm, let's say, uh, ancien regime, is, I think it's really the term that tells it all. So today we're going to make some points that really there is not much of substantial in terms of single topics. It's going to be a much of a theoretical thinking ab about it. Excuse me, I prepared myself by drinking a little. So here we go. And <coughs> but but not only this. I mean, I think just uh, if you're interested about the period, it, it's it's also very uh, fascinating in itself. And um, as I often say now, this has become my usual <laughs> topic of complaint: is that we study this period just because of um, the Viking Age, and essentially we ignore what was happening into continental Europe from an institutional point of view and so here in fact we're essentially discussing about post Carolingian Europe so more or less um, almost all today's France larger parts of today's Germany and Italy so this complex say uh, group of uh, central European states that um develop in, in developed in talented in, in similar and comparable ways thanks to the Carolingians. Um relatively to this uh, we, we will notice how such dynamics were of course in, in, in these various areas of Europe they varied a lot. I'm not saying it was everything in the same fashion but indeed um sometimes you know, back in the day, it was much more structuralist in the way I looked at history, meaning that I would have said, okay, this happened because there were certain preconditions that favored it, or that even triggered it properly. In which, which is, which is true. Definitely, you cannot understand what the Carolingians did if you don't understand how I don't know um, <coughs> Gallo-Roman Germanic uh, goal was, uh, especially in the north where the Carolingians and. But at the same time, indeed, th there have been so many, um, even single episodes that eventually have triggered what the Carolingian Europe would have been. Mm. Um, now, we we think that uh, I don't know the, the Carolingian uh, the Carolingians were a sort of uh, unavoidable mm, process that had to happen sooner or later. Actually, not. Uh, the fact that the Carolingian Empire existed in the first place is uh, something extremely accidental, um, <coughs> because if uh, if it, mm, you know even in in when when Carolingian dynasty had risen to to power in there, it would have sufficed, um, um, for instance, um, Carloman's uh, Carloman, um, I mean Charlemagne's brother, not to have died. 
for having made uh, basically the Franks keeping fighting each other busy like that and not eventually expanding to there. Or maybe they're just, I don't know, uh, Charlemagne had taken a cold when he was 16 and that he had died and we would have not had him. Same goes for Louis the Pius, who also was lucky enough to uh, remain the sole, um, uh, the sole uh, son, essentially. Uh, of uh, of uh, to 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 rule in there because the, the main trouble for the Franks is that in spite of all they they kept dividing the empire splitting the empire among the various male sons at every time it was a great handicap and in fact the Carolingians tried even to stem this especially these these two uh, monarchs but it, it I mean, story might have gone in another way. Uh, in, in fact, if what you see what happened to the Carolingian Empire, essentially, uh, it, it's the disaster that was in looming over this, uh, over this Frankish society because of those reasons, and that it took, I mean, two generations to happen. Uh, it might have happened as well two generations bef before, and uh, this might have changed completely the face of Europe. Um, we, uh, I mean, history, and uh, I mean the, the most refined uh, historical and and sociological studies tell us that uh, actually history might have gone radically in a different way in the first place. I mean, th there was nothing teleological in all these, let's say, historical stages that we consider from a from a um, um, from a periodizing point of view, because even massive structural events might have occurred. Uh, might have been curbed uh, or, mm, or developed in, uh, in completely different ways if, uh, I don't know, even a single person hadn't done something like that, which might sound strange, but I think the figure of Char Charlemagne is pretty uh, meaningful in that sense. Um, so, reflect upon it, because uh, what's the true importance of Carolingian Europe is that the Carolingians really messed up the situation. <laughs> I mean, they, they created um really a lot of mess because they favored a, a, a fragmentation that was otherwise unknown up to that time i mean it, sh it is sure that the, the carolingians invaded countries that weren't this massive um, centralized states that i don't know were flourishing on their own but um there were surely certain entities that were developing a bit on their own um like if you take the Saxons, they had their own kind of organization, which, in spite of fragmented, still had some communitary mm, political mm, action. If you take uh, the Longobard Kingdom, it also was evolving pretty, pretty interestingly in that direction. We can have a picture of what happened, for instance, uh, of what, what it might have happened uh, with, with the Anglo-Saxons, for instance, who weren't conquered by the Carolingians, and that albeit influence from them eventually rose to actually create a kingdom in and that was also a very pretty advanced thing from especially from an administrative point of view at the beginning let's say in in, in the second half of the 11th century when when it was conquered by the normans who were by the way at uh, this um essentially, uh, essentially frankish product from a political an institutional point of view, and, and also socially speaking, because th they had Frankish feudalism. In so the the main thing about the Carolingians is that, in in spite of of this political fragmentation, were to set certain um, characteristics, including these successory. I mean, the, the rise of the seigneuries and this um, pretty much a private conception of power. Mm? That, however, was so fragmented at a certain point that it was a sort of characteristics on its own. So, this feudalism eventually f flourished, even as a civilization, think about chivalric culture and all, from I into this very large area of Europe that had been, let's say, <laughs> contaminated, we can say. No, well, I, it's more. Uh, I, I look at, at it as a not really as a positive or a negative thing, but it's really, let's say, the, the fact that feudalism had a success in, in this sense is also partly due to the fact that, that in, in, in part it worked. Mm -hmm. As long as there were at least certain favorable conditions. Unfortunately, those conditions were 
there weren't, but mostly. Um, and I'm talking essentially about a strong power that could still, however, control those feudal lords. But even especially from a cultural point of view, the greatest legacy of the Carolingians was this um, cultural one. Mm. Not just the reform of the the, uh, the ecclesiastical customs and the, uh, the strengthening of ecclesiastical power, but also uh, all what it is entailed from a cultural point of view. Having a common uh, l a Latin uh, uh, alphabet for writing, I mean, um, and um, and having this um, kind of um, um, models that could be comprehended by all the populations that live in into the rather multi-ethnic Carolingian Empire. Um, if the Carolingians had not existed, this is, for instance, we, we would have remained, for instance, with a Europe uh, in which every region had a different writing. I mean, before the Carolingians, like the and before, let's say that the, the Carolina uh, character uh, um, was um, was spread, every place in Europe wrote in a different way. Then eventually, so-called Gothic writing that was actually called the Littera Moderna at the time. We are already later in time. It is we are roughly in the 12th century. Took over. So think of all the the implications that this had in European culture, how the Carolingians favored communication between, I don't know, at this time there was a very strong contact be between different areas of Europe because they the Carolingians had created this sort of um, of basin into which there was, uh, in spite of all the differences, there was still the, the, the way to interact, to to say to to exchange it, and the whole thing, by the way, I mean sometimes we reason as if, um, yeah, after the Carolingians there was no actual authority in there, um, and this is also false. The, all these populations were at that point framed in also this great uh, institutional um, and pretty uh, exceptional. I mean, uh, an unusual in and and new, let's be honest about it, institutional arrangement for which there was a universal empire once again in the West, that this was strongly connected with uh, the Roman Church that in this sense was permeating whole Europe in terms of evangelization, of ecclesiastical organization, of local uh, politics and all, all that. So really making th fitting this extremely wide area of Central Europe to base into into this frame mm, and and interacting on that in on that base uh, um, so it's very interesting also relatively to the uh, autonomistic tendencies of the post Carolingian kingdoms to to fragment themselves indeed uh, to fragment the same that unity was actually not an option it was still there I mean, these guys uh, ended the Carolingian Empire, might have said, okay, we'll come back the way we were before. All these split um, um, ethnic groups will mind their own business in a, in a certain sense. No, they didn't. They stuck to the empire, they stuck to um, the seigneuries. Obviously, it wasn't something, um, you know, seigneurial power in this time merged also in a very positive way. Obviously it was the lords who had the, the interest for this to happen, but this is also pretty... Um, not not completely true. I mean, this surely happened, but we, it was the same local communities that actually entrusted power to these uh, lords. Mm? This is how feudalism was born. Uh, the harsh, oppressive feudalism is something that happened very late in time actually in the very late uh, Middle Ages, because that's w that was the moment to which the Ancien Regime was really sanctioned as a crystallite society. Um, the peasants w were at this point completely oppressed, but at during this time, actually, local communities were still extremely effervescent. There was definitely, especially in certain areas, from those uh, freemen standards that existed on average in the population, was a, a, drop, uh, a sharp drop. Take Germany, take Saxony, for instance. Those were 
relatively primitive and egalitarian society with a very few political segmentation with this body of free men that more or less functioned so at that time. Of course also aristocracies there ruled over free men and we don't have to, to imagine it at this uh, egalitarian Germanic world that in historically speaking never existed but it, it was still compared obviously to, 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 to France something completely different in in the Frankish world where just a very few guys at the top and the whole rest was being um, subject increasingly subjected but say still even in there communities were relatively um, dynamic and especially when political fragmentation occurred once again after post-Carolingian times these uh, the actually the feudal world the seigneurial system emerged from the needs of all these communities actually coming together often on, on a local base which partly in this sense triggered the um, territorial fragmentation proper because every place wanted to do it on its own or most of the times was also isolated think of all the, the communication problems and these second invasions that were messing up everything uh, so the uh, that makes sense so but we should see even the rise of feudalism as all these communities coming together and th the best example to read that is simply looking at um history of law uh, if you study uh, uh what did how the juridical system worked um you see that um uh, the customary law uh, that, that feudalism emerged actually is a customary law um or better feudalism was born from still the the concept of public authority that was enforced by a sovereign that delegated these vassals basically to 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 uh, to take pu to acquire public rights and to exercise them uh, territorially speaking but still the 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 concept the ideal of the germanic ideal of the freeman was still there uh, and basically these feudal lords were there not because there was a lot of ambiguity telling the truth but at least uh, how it developed in the absence especially at this time of a strong public authority is that the feudal lords had these public prerogatives that however had to be used to help the communities so the communities were theoretically still free and they were freely contracting um, a pact with the local lord that could be even a private person this is that's why it's ambiguous because eventually these all got mixed up with public authority as well it was formalized but the idea is also that it, it was a private contract you know that community of peasants says okay we were too weak to defend ourselves we have to mount about plugging the land you are a lord living in here so uh, we will give you enough resources to defend us, part of our work essentially, to defend us militarily for, for you to, provi to, to establish a military defense a and that's it we're not really losing our freedom for doing that, we are freely doing that. And, and of course the reality turns into some something m pretty darker that is obviously the, the Lord actually taking that power and misusing that, I mean uh, um, and 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 progressively transforming these freemen into 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 serfs in practice, but it all stemmed from technically a contract between two free contrarians, two free contractors, and say. So, the, um, and and by the way, these communities of peasants were still pretty dangerous; uh, they could overthrow even these uh, lords at one point not always it wasn't really the average but it still could happen i mean peasants peasant communities have been pretty dangerous let's say up to the very end of the middle ages and even beyond especially in certain uh, less developed areas and this less stratified socially stratified areas of europe hmm? so uh, it's it's obvious that french feudalism had a, a much tighter grip on the population but even in there um if you take the Jacquerie during the fourteenth century, it was a pretty messy thing. It was a pretty uh, disturbing thing that happened that the whole masses of peasants actually uh, doing very very 
big uh, things in terms of revolts and d devastations and slaughtering of the nobles and all. Eventually they lost it. I made a video about it that is called... Uh, let me check... which I discussed this, because these are important chapters in medieval history and they're pretty overlooked. Um, gets on my nerves when uh, when when medieval history is treated as if you know it was a sort of flat thing where things never change or wasn't oh uh, this is this is it late medieval peasants revolts a decisive and lost battle which i think the title already sums up pretty much what i, what I want to say but here, here or not is late medieval mm, so up to late the ma late middle ages peasants actually have w weren't these slaves of the land that uh, and that's it. They were actually pretty dynamic. Communities that could even take their own place still in the institutional uh, system. But, um, so, uh, today I wanted to talk also about encastellation partly, because that's another topic that I um, I care very much about because it's uh, probably one of the m most, at least for what I've seen, it happens in popular culture. It's one of the most misunderstood uh, phenomena of the Middle Ages. Um, uh, I've I've made a pair of videos on, on castellation, so it's useless for me to repeat myself. You can go check those out. They're always in the medieval society playlist. Um, but so, the multiplication of fortresses starts happening at this point, so between the 9th and the 10th century. Um, so this put definitely the, the public order of Carolingian tradition into crisis um, in many ways. So this is considered either as a symptom and a cause uh, of, of uh, or even as a um, the uh, even as a for say not just the main cause but even as just one of the causes of the transformation of every single Carolingian kingdom because the Carolingian Empire was already split at that point uh, in in theory as well as in practice well not in theory in, uh, I mean uh, the empire wasn't split uh, but in practice it was into these uh, kingdoms. So, uh, so d d d encastellation produced this um, tendentially and pretty variedly autonomous uh, areas that we're, uh, we, we don't have even here to understand as something um, pretty well um, determined, I mean, um, identifiable. Uh, like the the seigneuries and the mm, dialectic of of power that was uh, forming at this point was extremely extremely uh, complicated even from from a territorial point of view. The um, the the idea is that the um, you can't really figure out how a seigneury was extended on 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 a map. Because, first of all, that, that's something that varied continuously. So y even if you want to study it, historically speaking, at least at this time, where the situation was extremely more fluid, it's very much comp it's, it kind of doesn't make sense. It's even more it's even complicated when you know in feudal Europe, where more or less, I mean, in, in late Middle Ages, let's say, into which more or less certain um, patrimonial. Um, um, uh, goods were essentially uh, landed patrimonial goods were had this start taking these shapes more or less identifiable shapes and on the political map of Europe uh, but at this time I it's a complete mess by the way we don't have even enough sources even some of the greatest counties and duchies especially in France that so in a place where they would rise to be something very big compared to, to European standards it are pretty pretty obscure I mean we don't really have the sources we don't know wh when or how exactly certain seigneuries uh, started because simply we're not documented we have an idea uh, of course but also thanks to archaeology and all but 
Um, as in many times in history, we don't have tags that tell us is exactly what, what happened at that point. Um, so this in the encapsulation favored the process, mm? favored the, uh, the fragmentation, favored the, the even the um, um, the the um, the the, uh, the uh, mm, let's say the, the distanciation. I don't know how to say that uh, between um, certain areas because definitely also fragmentation implies um, difficulties of other nature for crossing, for instance, a certain land. Uh, this is also another very what I find at least personally very fascinating aspect of this is that. Um, we 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 are so used at this idea of of a fragmented Middle Ages or a fragmented Europe even into the modern age. I, I don't know. Think about Germany. Uh, the fact that uh, that they had like even in the full Middle Ages like three three hundred and fifty states in there. Um, think even f the problems that had they were solved actually only with the Germanic unification or at least with its override uh, in in into the nineteenth century. This problem that I every state you have a, 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 a you know if you were a merchant for instance uh, you had a toll to pay. Uh, so how that think of how that actually made economy stagnating? How complicated it was even to to move in there? Because maybe these mm, these seigneuries were at war against each other. Um, so it wasn't an easy. Well, at this point, I, I made just recently a video about um, the uh, medieval roads and communications. Essentially, especially thinking at this very period, so all the difficulties that existed at this time from that point of view, and 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 this triggered obviously the development of certain areas of Europe that um, obviously could be as small as I don't know certain this castle village district but it could they could be also larger kingdoms that kind of also started developed a different identity on their own and we have seen many times i mean carolingian europe there were these entities like lorraine for instance uh, lotharingia so-called lotharingia or Bur burgundy then albeit very differently basically they uh, they didn't come they didn't grow to become a, a kingdom they were eventually absorbed. They at least they didn't have any. In the case of Lotharingia, that, that was simply eventually down the split by between the eastern and western Francia. But even Burgundy, that remained institutionally a kingdom into the Holy Roman Empire for reasons that were also in their pretty utilitarian, telling the truth, uh, didn't make it to be a modern nation. France made it unexpectedly, telling the truth, because. Even the rise of the Capetians was something extremely miraculous <laughs> in that mess. Uh, Germany made it in this strange federative way that started conceiving the fact that it existed something like a Teutonic kingdom and with an attached Teutonic culture. Um, just a few days ago, I made a video a video about the Kingdom of Italy during the same moments, the same period, and how basically. Uh, it, it could exist a kingdom of Italy, and it definitely also existed at, at a point. Then eventually, in, into the lower Middle Ages, it, it fermented, it, especially because of the rise of the communes and also. Uh, but let's say that there were even, even in extremely fragmented areas. That, that here, the kingdom of, of Germany and the kingdom of Italy are kind of meaningful from this point of view. That uh, even the kingdom of France, so really this encompassed the whole Carolingian lands kind of, in spite of their problems and fragmentation, kind of developed sort of proto-national identities on their own. Chiefly because there already existed some kind of local mm, identities, so that predated the Carolingian world. So it's obvious that the Franks, for instance, Fran Fran today's France is born out of actually an two nations. The, the northern one was the fr probably Frankish one and the Occident one in the south. Italy, at least in the center in the north, it had this Longobard kingdom and more or less had framed these the Italic populations into a an institutional frame. Germany, aspired, in spite they were all different mm, say this sort of tribal, uh, at least often is explained in this way, but at that time wasn't much uh, telling the truth in Carolingian times a matter of tribal 
identities anymore. It was still, however, these aristocracies that more or less spoke sim different languages. I, I don't know, take the, the Swabians, the Bavarians, the Thuringians, the Saxons, but so they were a bit different, but they were still at least Germanic. So they spoke a similar language, they they were in contact, they had... Germany was pretty fragmented, from a, especially from a geographical point of view, because these actually these divisions had occurred because of these very thick forests that and very large forests that existed in Germany and still exist by the way in part um, in um, that had made communication difficult so that's why these kind of ethnic blocks had, had shaped but at this point especially from uh, the ca w that's why I was saying the Carolingian culture was important because especially from certain very important cultural m and especially monastic centers like uh, St. Gallen in Switzerland it was Alemannia at that time and um, and uh, Lorsch in, in, uh, in, in Saxony began to say okay to, to, to create this idea of, of a Teutonic identity that was essentially the Eastern Frankish one, that is essentially this proto-German identity. So this was in part favored, as we've seen, by many factors, and it was actually also strengthened by... or weakened, in, in depending on which standards you're taking, by encastellation. Because encastellation was essentially, at that time, for the military technology of that time, equated that if you built a castle in one place, that changed a freaking lot of the wo local dynamics from a political and social point of view. You created a sort of state on your own. Um, this is also what is fascinating about those times, that if you were um, an enough entrepreneurial um, mm, you know, mm, warrior, you d it really didn't have even to, to be a noble at that point, because, by the way, it was nobility, even in Carolin by Carolingian standards. Sometimes the Carolingians made counts, um, um, I don't know, maybe serfs that had escaped and that, that they had joined the army and had been so courageous and brave that they hadn't been named counts. I mean, even formalities in this world weren't really there, especially when when a, a public authority is collapsing and everybody can do essentially what they, they want. Uh, it is true though that we're still local aristocracies, so it was different, very different, relatively difficult to, to make it uh, from, from nothingness. But even if you take certain, you know, the, the major uh, dynasties that rose eventually there, to take the, the Ottonians, I was just talking about the Ottonians the other day. Um, it, uh, those were just like the Carolingians back in the day. To be honest, they they were they were rising from relative nothingness. The Ottonians were descending from Vidukind, essentially, or a relative, a female relative of her of him. I don't remember really, and a an obscure ca an obscure Carolingian count that had been settled into this desolated Saxon frontier, in there. So who were they? They, 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 one of the greatest complexes of the Ottonians is that they didn't have a noble, a noble background, but nor the Carolingians actually had. Uh, and uh, this happened for many other dynasties that rose on, you know, th these territories back in the day. Um, so um, it was a really fluid situation. And the whole fluidity was actually dictated by political and especially militarily dynamics. Mm. So these military dynamics are very important to understand this moment uh, because uh, it's first of all the moment into which feudali feudalism in the first place, the so-called vassalatic beneficiary system, uh, in the history we, we don't, I, I say feudalism now to make you understand what it really was about, but feudalism is, we tend to, to picture it as the lower medieval thing, the lower medieval uh, institutional frame where there was already a, a well, def a more or less well-defined um, feudal uh, hierarchy with titles that, in this sense, dated back from from these very times, the 9th to the 10th century, to the Carolingian times, post in post Carolingian, immediate post Carolingian times, and that are more or less well-sanctioned. This was still a very primitive world with this vassalatic beneficiary system was actually something emerging from the 
the the uh, the hybrid uh, Romano-Germanic clientels. So it was uh, also in here something that had its roots, not just, I mean, it's not that Carolingians invented a uh, clientelism. All these societies back in the day were clientelarly. What the Carolingians did was for the first time to, to put a huge amount of, at least for European standards, because this happened already, I don't know, in Persia, for instance, to put a huge amount of, uh, of resources, of land, into the hands of a very few people. So creating clientels were much more verticized uh, that could allow this um, elite to be not just a political and social elite but also a military elite and that's where um, feudal cavalry in, um, in, in, in European, in chivalric Europe actually is born because of course cavalry existed also before and there are very very important cultural continuities that exist since the Indo-European, uh, the Indo-Aryan times, let's say, of the steps into feudal, full chivalric age. But nobody in Europe at that point have, had ever seen a feudalism like that. I mean, so many, uh, so much land for keeping a single guy with armor, with, with, with a war horse and all the gear and all. So that's where actually feudal, I, I, this that very heavy cal European calories is going to is developing. Um, you might argue that during the early Middle Ages, uh, the progressive loss of um, the freeman's autonomy was slowly forming into something already a bit feudal on its own in certain areas, even before the Carolingian conquest. Uh, well, mm, yes, but the what the Carolingians did was something that cannot be compared in scale. I mean, surely Europe would have not transformed the way it was if so quickly as it did without the Carolingians. Excuse me, a drink a little once again. So the landscape of the ninth, tenth century, and to arrive to maybe for today's video, just to, to the beginning of on the first half of eleventh century Europe was marked by these um, vassalatic clientels and of uh, relative military retinues. Now these retinues could be either they were essentially of two nature uh, of, na of, uh, of two natures. The first one were the so-called so uh, masnate. That is this term that. Um, uh, me uh, identified um, I mean from an etymological point of view the uh, the, the term m m m it, it came from the Provencal now this is interesting because by the way Provence was not this excessively feudalized area but it still was invested by the Carolingian uh, uh, vassalatic beneficiary system so it comes from the term mais nada that means a uh, family serve them um and uh, it comes from the latin mansionata so relatively to something that was given with a mansio that is a uh, a place to live like an habitation something like that so the mansionata were those guys who were given essentially by the lord certain uh places to survive uh, I mean to survive, to to, to leave, <laughs> and 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 this is true because these guys, the masnate, were essentially made up of the closest um, relatives and serfs most of the time of the of the lords. So these were actually even provided with the seigneurial uh, surplus stocked into these mountain bailey castles that were being built in the, the two su in, in these warehouses uh, w um, in d into these stocks etc. that were very important for seigneurial economy. I made incidentally also a video about this the importance of excuse me search it for it a little the importance of uh, supplies and famines in manorial economy. This is... Uh, I'm changing the title now because I don't like it. <laughs> well, I will change it later. I wanted to say seigneurial economy, but 
uh, he discussed in there exactly in, in this um, period how important that was actually for, I mean, stocks and um, this kind of seasonal agricultural production, um, how it really important was for the, the structuring of um, the seigneuries at, at this time. And, I mean, ag agri the agricultural world uh, works wi on the seasonal rhythms uh, in all times, <laughs> so it's n nothing n uh, new, but let's say it's it's really in, in castellation, that this is what I meant. In castellation allowed basically to um, to stock all these um, resources and 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 basically um, controlling them, and uh, controlling through that also the in the um, here I'm changing it. See, new real economy. Okay, I I name it the importance of supplies of and famines in seigneurial economy because kind of makes more sense because by the way famines in fact w this were there was a, a moment in w into which uh, the lords um, I mean having built these castles could really uh, gain a higher bargaining power with peasant communities because if, the, if there was a famine and peasants were starving uh, this uh, the lord had its own stocks to say okay I give you I, I won't um, let you starve to death but I want something in exchange so other services other so you know, in the contract that they had, something that obviously uh, was more in favor of the Lord and less in favor of the uh, communities. Um, but uh, I mean, the Masnada were in this sense; th those guys were lived into the Lord's house. So you have many. This is actually what happened also in non-Carolingian lands. If you take the Huscarls in the Scandinavian world, that thi that really means it. It means the men of the house. So they are the retinues. So you understand how even these societies, um, in spite of, of these big differences for those time standards, were still based on, on, on similar, uh, um, let's say, structures for which military retinues. Th this, this exists also in, into the Slavic world. Think about the Drudzinas. Think about. So, yeah, there, was the, 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 there were, by the way, bands of tugs. We have to think of this like uh, the, uh, like uh, the mob, the local mob. It wasn't different like that. Uh, the the reason uh, uh, there isn't really actually um, uh, a difference between uh, uh, between a tribute and a payoff, okay? Because protection works like that. So you have to think really about medieval Europe as a sort of uh, uh, a whole mafia thing <laughs> in everything. This seigneurial power was based exactly on, on the same, on the same uh, logic. And this was definitely also wrapped into these cultural ideals of the lords of the guys. But it was actually of the chivalric culture. But it was actually a pretty nasty thing. But what is in is interesting, telling the truth, um, is that. Um, so another legacy of Carolingian Europe is that these lords basically began, even if they were often one against the other and always in conflict, but at least they recognized each other's uh, belonging to a certain class, we can say. Um, and that's w these are the centuries into which the, the ideal of nobility, of, of blood, for instance, th th well, that something was something pretty, pretty ancient. Um, but uh, I mean, there, there was this idea that basically every lord b was they, they kind of recognized each other as, some, as something different from the rest of the population, mm. even of course at their own benefit because we're thinking obviously to be better than the other. I mean, th that uh, insane and in insanely uh, strong sense of superiority of feudal or the feudal elite was born in in these moments. So these were actually uh, also extremely violent people that committed all the worst kind of crimes and atrocities so it was an extremely violent world and I don't like to stress this that much because I always want to rationalize these behaviors on the base of, of, of the local political and social dynamics because this is how we actually work but in as act I mean there was this uh, imagine a stateless world de facto everybody's doing what y y they want and 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 this partly by the way this violence partly conf was um 
I can't say accepted fully because definitely those who suffered it weren't happy of it, but there was a kind of um, a pride at belonging, for instance, to to a certain lordship. Okay, so if you were a peasant uh, uh, that couldn't defend himself, I mean, yeah, you were probably vexed by your local lord, but still that lord provided for your defense, because the defense of your land was usually the defense of, of even of the revenues that, that that same lord had. So there was this idea that in spite of the, the misery of that world of the hates, of the uh, of the violences, of the um, of the abuses and all, there was this idea of, of look at these knights, those are the guys will really know what what they're what they're gonna do, and and these were in fact from from a military point of view, they what were had a, they had a very high military quality from an individual point of view. They, they were extraordinary figures. I made a video um, some time ago that is called Odo of Cluny, Gérald de Vaurillac, and Secular Holiness. That is a video in which uh, it's actually about. Um, uh, religion. Uh, it's about the um, uh, Gérard de Vaurillac, in fact. But I, I discuss exactly these things in there, because um, s s the basically to this saint was attached a secular, in fact, uh, it was attached a secular holiness to one of these aristocrats. So the, the, the legion in there, the geography says basically that this guy uh, was could conciliate the sword with uh, holiness, and this was meant to comfort in in those uh, ye in into those centuries, this idea that uh, the because by the way, uh, uh, feudal lords at that time were all one with the. Um, I mean, the, the the seigneurial families were the ones from which also abbots and bishops came from. So and and sometimes the difference was quite blurry because as we know, for instance, bishops and abbots participated to warfare as well. So that was a very interesting um, religious synthesis in Otto of Cluny's work of uh, let's say trying to reconcile the 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 secular aristocracy ethos with the the Christian holiness. That that is not it is something very fascinating how he achieved that. It's also very poetic. I I liked very much that video. I mean I think it can be interesting for you. So um so this is and so the um I don't remember what we were talking about right now. <laughs> Um, the mm, oh yeah, and there were uh, essentially two types of um, of troops. Uh, the masnate, as we've seen uh, and as we've said, and the um, and the uh, so-called family armati. So the family armati were basically these um, um, bands of uh, actually of peasants that these weren't actually very um, th 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 they weren't the guys who lived into into the uh, the Lord's house telling the truth but it um, I mean they uh, they were definitely um, still framed into the seniorial um, domination we can say uh, the um, uh, the idea is that they, they th th and this is why I was saying before that peasants were so important into the seigneurial world because they um, still participated to the seigneurial um, business and and they were uh, definitely instrumental to back the the rise of of feudalism. So once again, we don't have to reason as if these peasants were necessarily. Um, oppressed or as if they, they didn't have any room for political or even military action. So the family, arma the familus is, it, the name comes from, obviously from family, from, from the Latin familia. So these were actually a bit of a more, uh, there was still this idea that they belonged, that they were faithful to the Lord, but uh, that they had a, a much more... By the way, even with the Masnate, it's, it's difficult to actually distinguish one another, because we don't really know who they... Um, th they had a very variegated, variegated origin. 
um, the and and even the 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 lords were really um, so you have to imagine I mean these bands as being you know a bunch of cavalrymen that you you can't think I don't know for a, for a German for for an Eastern Frankish lord in an extremely dispersed area to have more than I don't know four or five uh, heavily armored guys along with with him if he had just a modern melee we have to think an extremely material um, materially poor world, so nothing extremely. Probably the French are the the French had the largest client clientele, as we've seen. Mm. More agricultural resources, more verticized society, more ancient, um, let's say, uh, clientelism. So these guys, those guys, could have th they had the best retinues. In fact, the French cavalry was renownedly conceived as the best cavalry in, in the world at the time be because of this, because essentially they. Because of these back bases they had, they were wealthy. They were more well. They were wealthier. They had more. Uh, they worked better together as c large bodies of calorymen. I don't know. Maybe a Germanic calorymen was individually still better. Also because he came from a wilder world that was still not r fully um, even Christianized or, or you know or, or urban at, at all. Germany remains into the. <laughs> you know, into the forest literally for, for centuries once again. But, but what makes effect, especially in these open fields of Western Europe, is um is these large trained bodies of cavalrymen who already know what to do in collective formation. Mm. And that's what um, the military thing really was. That that also depended on the terrain. It's pretty much obvious that into Germany that is covered in it was covered in swamps and, and forests cavalry was also less suitable and the Carolingians knew that for instance at Suntal where they suffered a very bad defeat of their cavalry against the the uh, but even there uh, against the Saxons I mean but uh, the Saxon infantry um, but even in there you know you have to think still you know this cavalry being pretty pretty flexible pretty adaptable in many s in situations and that also the Carolingians and this in th it's still into this world the 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 average uh, European knight at this time was pretty much used also to, to that fierce individualistic edus as a warrior etc and it would keep it for for a very long time uh, by the way so we we are in a world of transition this is what I find also fun very interesting of that uh, of that moment and uh, relatively to the lords I mean who were these lords. We have seen that the situation was very, very varied. So um, there could be um, these dynasts could be could vary from really, as we've said, from a local guy who had like a tower and lived in there, and spread terror along the, <laughs> the local peasantry to to get food to to get, you know, um, you know, the, the to steal the surplus and all. Uh, they could be also the emperor mm. uh, like we've seen with the Ottonians, Otto the first big uh, duke of Saxony eventually elected king of Germany and eventually crown and, and then king of Italy and then uh, um, Roman emperor uh, crowned Roman emperor by, by the Pope uh, so this major international figure involved into major international buildings so the into international politics, so everything could vary from this top to bottom into this very varied range of size. Mm -hmm. The most, let's say, the the Carolingian world ha had left this districtuation that was mostly counties and marches, uh, and these were the average sized thing, and it usually corresponded to a to a dioceses. So there is a bit of continuity also with the ancient Roman. Uh, um, at the time of Diocletian, when when the Roman Empire was districtuated into these smaller things, uh, usually there is a continuity also in that from a territorial point of view. Naturally, this is truer in places of ancient Romanization, like in uh, I don't know, into Italy or in, in 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 southern France. This is not true in Germany, that hadn't known that form of organization that, that was exported from France in, in there. Uh, by the Carolingians, uh, even before with the Merovingians, were some colonization in southern Germany. But let's say that in Carolingian times, it's the moment in which the largest re reorganization is done. The Carolingians fi um, invade uh, Germany, 
up to the Elbe River and they start building churches and, and dioceses to control the territory because there were no cities so they start building them around the church and and uh, eventually the Ottonians at this point expand the f eastern frontier across the Elbe against the Slavs and even in there they they proceed this colonization with dioceses castles and so um, even their new um, in fact the political geography of Germany in this sense is, is very different from say the one of France or, or the one of Italy because it, it they all ch they, they were different so uh, this, these are the differences I was talking to you about before but still the, the all these areas have in common the comital district to Asian, the diocese and the the castles and castellation spreading and so this even by the way a very sedentary world and you don't have to take uh, sedentarization as a um, uh, as a banal thing at these times because the Slavs, even the Scandinavians, even in, into Britain, not everything was really settled down. That th there was a, s a certain some sort of semi-nomadism, especially in Eastern Europe, um, simply because cities in certain areas didn't exist. Um, and so, they d and and they didn't exist for a reason. It's not that they were a bunch of primitives with clay uh, clubs. That it's, it's simply that the local economy had not supported that. So there were other forms of settlement, and some of them were also uh, the Slavs, for instance, at this time were still pretty much in motion, mm -hmm. and they had still to settle down uh, according to the the identities that exist today into 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 Europe, the various ethnicities. Um, and this partly had still to do with Germany. Now, Germany at this time was fully set, going, growing fully sedentarized, but it still had pretty much in common also with those lands. And there wasn't an extreme difference by the Germanic peoples and the Slavs, by the way, uh, at this point. Um, so, um, the telling to so, in which kind of origin these lords could have? In terms of you know, uh, especially within the insti Carolingian institutions, well, they could be functionaries. Remember the 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 Carolingian missi dominici, so the seigneurial uh, envoys. Uh, those were the royal envoys, by the way. Um, yeah, uh, there was some sedentarization of those, also because the missi dominici were usually. A uh, an aristocrat, let's say a secular aristocrat and a, a and a clergyman, and they both had these public prerogatives. Um, the, the the Carolingians had looked a bit like at the Longbirds as a mono. Basically, they were sending these functionaries, public public functionaries, wh which is pretty weird to say in the Carolingian case because these were still private people in, in the, with their own power. They were they were taken from the aristocracy um, to go check certain area to maybe initially to be uh, even against the local communal power and then eventually even substituting to it in a certain measure so even these guys had pro progressively doesn't matter whether laymen or clergymen they had basically stayed remaining there with those prerogatives which nobody had claimed back from from the public side because and they had other things to to think about it, chiefly, uh, you know, the Carolingians were exterminating <laughs> one against the other, and um, so these prerogatives were at, at, at times were even reconfirmed at a local level. So, sedentarization uh, taking those roots and even uh, hereditary um, um, character of these rights was being formed. Very famous is the capitular of Kersi sur sur Oise, uh, at the time of um, of of Charles the Bold, the Bald, sorry, not the Bold, um, who in France, in into we the Western Frankish Kingdom at the end of the ninth century, would basically stated that at least the the lesser, uh, at least uh, the those who. Uh, um, those who had received, because this was actually the matter, uh, is, is that the, the actually the feudal, the major feudal charts were kind of considerable as hereditary. Then eventually it's just in the 11th century that there is one for the lesser, 
feudal possessions, but even in here it's misin often misinterpreted because uh, this was in 877. And because in the, in the document it states that this happened as long as the king had an issue to that, which is kind of interesting because the idea, thinking about also communications, but basically the capitular of Kersi simply says that um, as always, like it was in Carolingian mind, the whole kingdom, the whole empire belonged to the uh, imperial dynasty as a private possession. So in this frame, uh, obviously the, the dynasty had given land to someone to, to guard it uh, on, on its own behalf, etc. So when that functionary, that feudatory died, I mean the new first the news had to travel first of all so it took some time before uh central power realized that and and therefore or maybe the, the the king has not had not been elected because there was a civil war going on all these messy problems so uh, this capitular basically stated that as long as a new order didn't arrive this son of that feudatory could uh, take uh, his, his own uh, father inheritance uh, in terms of those rights so this was also um, Dan um, the, the this the, this is also a theory. The naturally, the reality is that, especially by that time in the seventies of the ninth century, the Carolingian Empire was 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 at the fruit. We we can say we did they uh, it was tearing apart by itself and chiefly by these same. Uh, officials in the same territories, so this was already happening, and that's because the the public authority had sensibly weakened by that point. Um, so we've seen they could be functionaries, so public officials, but they also could be bishops and abbots. This is a very important part of the story because ecclesiastical lordships at this point are rising extremely fast uh, and, and they were often stronger even the dis and the lay ones because the church had already certain rights of inalienability of the, the mm, patrimonies and uh, they um, they already covered other um, um, offices by tradition especially bishops had especially in Gaul, uh, in France, they, they had uh, historically, since Roman times, interruptedly this uh, lordships over, over the cities. Hmm? Uh, France had uh, cities at this time, N not uh, hugely developed, but still extremely important uh, for territorial control, and etc. And uh, so these guys were already quite powerful on their own in the urban um in a um, say in the uh, citizenry and they they had all their uh, net of relations with their clientele and their own very powerful individuals and by the way bishops uh excuse well would say it later but also abbots abbots were instead usually new uh abbots developed largely during the carolingian times and later times uh, during the Ottonian dynasties as well, this is what the, the Ottonians did in Germany as well, um, because abbeys were, I mean, the, the, as we've seen, the Carolingian Europe had also, uh, the Carolingian expansion had involved also a big deal of uh, evangelization, and especially in those territories where cities did, did not exist, so into which dioceses were a bit weaker, Creating an abbey, especially somewhere, uh, I don't know, in the country, was a very important way of creating... First of all, these abbeys could be even, architectonically speaking, something pretty sound. So, um, religious buildings at this time had also some kind of military function. Especially everything you built in stone at that time had a, mil a strategic uh, and tactical value. Um, um, but in this sense, they could control. The, 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 they had lots of land. Usually, these abbots, uh, these abbeys, were also founded by, as we've seen, either the, by by the local uh, 
I made lots of videos about this, about the um, by the 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 aristocracy it could be also in here from it could range from imperial class aristocracy to to the lowest um, um, smallest seniors. We usually instead found small chapels, country chapels or parishes and all. I've made some videos. Maybe I could uh, advise you to look at if you're interested. Um, yeah. I've made uh, lots of videos actually. The one is called Donations to Churches in, in, in Late Medieval, uh, in the Late Carolingian Empire. The other one is Parishes, Monasteries, and Local Communities in Post Carolingian Europe. Another thing is Ecclesiastical Estates in Late Carolingian Era. Yeah, I made really a lot of those. Uh, ecclesiastical Power in Carolingian Europe. Um, private Churches in High Medieval Europe. Monasteries as connective tissue post Carolingian Europe. So lots of videos made about this topic and I think it's really worth it because it's it's really, you know, the key of understanding um medieval Europe. I mean these post Carolingian times, if you don't understand what ro what kind of role these aristocracies had, I both the secular and the ecclesiastical ones ecclesiastical ones you, you can't understand properly medi the rest of the Middle Ages. Um there is no way. Uh, so, and what I was saying is that uh, post Carolingian, uh, ex excuse me, the Carolingians had, and, and later the Ottonians, etc., had both, especially this. Well, ha it, well, it happened pretty much everywhere, in, in every single uh, post Carolingian kingdom, that uh, the public authority, the imperial, the royal one, always backed and was backed in turn by the church. This was a kind of a leitmotiv of of medieval Europe because uh, in medieval Europe the church was one of the few unitary institutions and, and let's say more than unitary at, at least one of the few functional institutions that existed. In Carolingian Europe it was also pretty unitary because the Carolingians had been backed uh, actively by the popes so from Rome, uh, the popes controlled a big deal of what was happening in terms of ex ecclesiastical organization all over the continent. Um, and it was a mutual interest for, I mean, as long as there was a public authority, ecclesiastics were kind of um, safeguarded in terms of right of patrimonial alienation, I mean, protection from patrimonial alienation and confiscation and all. So the ecclesiastics have always tried to back royal power, and and much actually of uh, eventually the uh, the uh, what concerns the the emergence of a French and a German crown actually is owed to the church, and especially the French monarchy had this atavic relation with the church ever since the Merovingian times. And uh, these ultra-religious um, pious monarchs that had to prove, you know, it was all uh, one with, with the institute, what the French monarchy was really about. In in Germany, it was relatively different because uh, Germany didn't emerge as a as a national monarchy eventually, even if it was still feasible at one point. But uh, in this sense, the fragmentation of Germany uh, was partly um stamped in its negative effects thanks to the church uh, especially these big bishoprics like like Mainz, Trier and Cologne and that's why the, by the way the Ottonians export also in Italy in Italy also there were these strong cities w and sh and bishops in there were quite powerful so uh I talked about that uh, last time uh last video made made about the Ottonians in the Kingdom of Italy, so they, the Ottonians, th they couldn't control the, the Italic aristocracies, and they basically start to back the local bishops in the cities to oppose the rural lords and to make an headway into Italy through that. So a very strong relation that existed between um, lay and, s and, and uh, sa say secular and ecclesiastical aristocracy at this time. Um... But when talking about encastellation, 
and the fragmentation of postcard ranger in Europe, you cannot but understand it was a big deal of private initiative behind the, the emergency of um, of of um, of, si uh, of lords or lordships. So a lot of private pro um, owners that really had didn't have a noble origin. They were maybe land owners, people who had made money with trade, who had this was typical of Italy usually and also partly of northern France. Um, the mm, so we didn't belong strictly to the ancient Germanic aristocracy uh, that had emerged from a lower um, uh, and they um, and however were, were quite successful for instance Italy at this point has a big deal of, the, of, it, of the Italian encastellation actually starts because of those people who weren't building castles much for the sake of defense at all because that's by the way not the first, I mean, from defense for invasions, but actually for being building castles to sell to other people. This was this level of entrepreneur, I mean, uh, of uh, enterprise, let's say, uh, the time, and uh, especially because central authority in Italy was pretty weak, so all these castles begin to pop out, and you realize that it was local communities building them not just for the sake of defense, but also for for really a market of castles that existed out there. This also was partly comforted by the public authority that existed in there, um, in 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 some measure. So this is kind of interesting how how it worked, and the um, so yeah. So uh, w I cannot stress enough the importance of how really diverse uh, these lordships could really be, especially in size and shapes. Uh, there were lordships that uh, and basically swallowed others in in spatial terms, um, and that were whose relations were extremely intricate, um, and uh, certain were huge, certain were small, but at the same time even the huge ones could fragment uh, from a generation to another, uh, because I don't know, maybe the, the Lord didn't have male uh, children, and uh, or maybe he was killed. Uh, the line went extinguished, and therefore it fragmented once again. So, and maybe the, the small, the small seniory at that point emer had room for for emerging. Um, these uh, liaisons, say these bonds, were were extremely uh, differentiated as well. They were, they were juridical sometimes. Uh, I mean, they framed into the, the idea of the public right and all. But some of them were very um, much more much freer. Uh, actually, the majority of them were pretty a private business. They were simply contracts. Mm -hmm. So there were these normal vassalic relations were really popping out everywhere. Like mushrooms, <laughs> really, in the in the European uh, in the European uh, uh, undergrowth, and uh, so these uh, we've so we've talked about this on the channel how the auto fealty worked, how the vassalatic relations were created. Um, that it was the senior and the vassus, and all uh, this um, public ceremony of uh, of the uh, swearing of the oath of, uh, of uh, oath of fealty, who was sworn on the Bible publicly, vocally, also because m large areas of the Carolingian Empire, uh, say post Carolingian Europe, still worked with this oral tradition, uh, especially in the less uh, literate areas. Of Northern Europe, um, in continuity with the uh, old oral Germanic traditions, essentially. So, but this was done everywhere, tell me the truth. Uh, it's just that certain areas produce more documents, so that was even sanctioned uh, with notaries and all. So, uh, Europe is is rising; it's on the rise. So uh, that you you can't start finding. 
actually also pretty consistent amount of sources of documents, of contracts, charters, etc. relatively to that. Um, but sometimes these relations maybe didn't even exist. I mean, at least they, w they weren't really formalized I in such a fashion. Mm? So they weren't they weren't explicitated. Th there are certain inherent strategic dimensions about this that went lost in this sense because we got maybe the document that has survived through the uh, through the centuries. But we we don't know what what it really was in reality. I mean, there were lots of, of lords who, you know, interacted among each other, you know, on base of private agreements and some measure was untold. Even you know, if you even if you look at the lower medieval Europe, you realize that many. Uh, you have to think that this will uh, was all about continuous warfare as well, and and those are all think about also the share of of the loot and all that also consisted in two land and occupying someone else's land. It was something probably much more direct. It wasn't sanctioned. Okay, they said, okay, I take that land, you take that. Okay, fine. Well, we shouldn't underestimate the actual the value of a contract, the fact of writing that down. But in certain cases, I mean, certain seniors had formed in ways that, I mean, th they were there de facto and nobody had sanctioned them. And and, and that eventually enters, inter, uh, uh, excuse me, entered later just with customary law uh, into a written form, but it maybe, maybe th that had occurred, I don't know, generations before. So, um the th this game of subordinations could really um stem from say uh from a from from a, a lesser area into a larger one um that could be in the sense uh, evidently subordinated to the supremacy of a of a formally comital or marginal or ducal uh, dynasty uh, uh, even into the area of a kingdom Okay, so there was this hierarchy of you know the, the, the Carolingian strictuation was still there uh, in some part, and uh, duchies were usually more in, into Italy, uh, but they were also into Germany. So the, because those were more culturally more Germanized uh, areas, so the, the duchy, so this duke title, mm, let's say. Um, the, the Carolingians paradoxically fitted more into into a Romanized um, tradition um, than what it had been Longobards or I don't know the the, the peoples of Germany and all. Uh, because into uh, Gallo-Roman, into the Gallo-Roman world, the, the lo Roman legacy had survived in part. But even the Comitatus also stems from from a Germanic tradition as well. So y y you find these different names, a territorial organization. But um, yeah, they kind of they, they were kind of similar also in many ways. So the um so and and this is important w the world picture was framed into a kingdom okay uh an into greater empire when there was one <laughs> uh the kingdom was usually the most uh, the greatest reference because the king because kings existed at this time they had a power it's not the carolingians vanished and there was no power at all we like to stress the the vacuum of power because it wasn't something as big as but how how it had been in Carolingian times, but still kings existed. They had some power. Uh, there was some interest, however, of, of the local seigneuries to actually not just to counter this centralizing push, but also to assist it in the case of war, of threat, etc. Think about how the uh, the Ottonians rose. Uh, Germany was being tempested by Hungarian uh, Hungar ra uh, major raids. Um, and uh, well, okay, these local German aristocracies that couldn't care less about, you know, sticking together or creating a, a sovereign uh, rule like a monarchy. Well, decided, okay, well, it's better if we entrust power to someone because to, because these hungers are really a pain in the behind, and and they they chose this 
the Duke of Saxony was the, the toughest guy around at the time, and 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 that's how he exploited uh, that position to eventually create what you know the the the, uh, the Ottonian Empire. Let's call it this way. Um, but this importance of, of the authority was of the public authority wa was still great, also for another reason. That is that. Uh, the Carolingians had learned how to go by right, by law, by documents. So uh, mm, d there would be also other interests for these local aristocracies to ca uh, to to back the royal power. There was a sp uh, this was done especially by that aristocracies at least of of medium size, like the one of the counties of the duchies and the marches. That was basically getting a written charter that uh, from the public authority that stated that I don't know that count had uh, that you had those certain rights, okay, in those lands, um, and uh, that was quite important. So if you have, in order to to see uh, your possession uh, legitimized. You need a l you 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 need a, l a legitimizing authority, and since it was it was the, the royal one, it doesn't matter how weak the king actually was, but it still was something called that you could uh, to have a <laughs> have written charter that um, sanctioned that you had those rights, and you would try to keep that in uh, very uh, very jealously <laughs> into your castle somewhere safe. Because that was uh, a very important thing. You could wave like this because public authority was public authority. Point. It was already this big struggle for for creating one, for keeping it alive, and it was a, a lot of competition also for for local aristocracies to rise to kingship. That nobody w was diminishing in this sense the public authority from a, from a from a legal point of view, because this well, that was uh, an extremely powerful tool from a political point of view to say that public authority is the absolute authority at this point just the, uh, that, that um, because emperors or kings are placed there by God so consider this too that that time they, they really looked upon this uh, as a matter of um, legitimization so um, having a charter that time was something extremely precious okay because it had a, a, a legal value just like today um, and unfortunately, for instance, during the French Revolution, we had among the, these various shameful things that happened. Uh, that the, the uh, all these ancient charters of the French nobility were burnt down by uh, the revolutionaries. So we had this fantastic episode in the, in the to which we lost uh, an irreparably uh, precious part of the French Middle Ages. Um, and therefore one of the most important uh, pieces of European history because a bunch of uh, fanatics destroyed castles and all the documents contained and all this stuff. Whatever. <laughs> it's uh, the fantastic history of the world. And uh, But these thing things existed. It's very, very, very old. And I don't know what I'd give to have those things still intact today to, to go look to know more about, in that case, about French French history, exactly because as we were saying before, we don't know excessively much about those early days. Um, because uh, during the French Revolution, that was really the uh, the symbol of aristocracy proper. So think about these charters. It was they were part of the n um, noble French house, uh, French noble houses treasures. So they were seen as even as the symbol, as the legal sanction, you know, the, of their power in the Ancien Regime. So the French revolutionaries at that time were doing a big deal, also of juridical, um, uh, per, let's say, uh, renovation. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, so they were building a state that had different legal premises, le different legal bases. So burning that those documents was also a matter of a pretty strong ideological slogan. Uh, and um, the um, 
And okay, I would like to conclude by simply saying well, this is more or less what I wanted to say. So it was just a, a, a pretty long ramble <laughs> about actually things I already t uh, talked about sometimes, but maybe today we we got we gave another frame to it to it because I think it's important to actually repeat things. Repetita juvent, the, the Latins said. So this, as long as you repeat that, this is going to be useful to remember. Um, because aside from the fact that they talk about these things always in very general terms, so there is always something more to add about it. Um, uh, I, I repeat, I'm stressing this. Um, this is a crucial moment of European history. Uh, so don't study the 9th and 10th centuries just because, I don't know, there were Vikings there. Study also these things, because these are eventually, uh, they had a legacy that lasted much longer. And they, they, they framed basically most of what we think about in the Middle Ages, even in popular culture, even, it, it, it starts from here. And, um, it's of excruciating importance. And what I wanted to add, Andley, is that the beauty of this, and I don't know if I'll ever do it this on the channel because I lack, I'm not an expert on t the period. I have never researched about these charters. And, um, I know certain single cases, etc., but I'm what is important about this is that uh, I'm I'm very often very theoretical relatively to these topics because they because of the diver diversification of all the various de declinations of, of how these phenomena could occur. Uh, but what is really interesting about it is would be studying case by case. So looking at every single, <laughs> even the smallest European county of Central Europe and saying, okay, let's study this as a case. I mean, there is all a, an historiography about this, and I don't know. Maybe in the future we'll get into it. Who knows? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not. So I, for at the moment, I can't provide the kind of information. But um, I still think it's um, it's a moment that we can really scope better, and that deserves uh, really, really a lot of attention. And and we have to rethink. And I know that it, to many of you this is probably boring. I, I realized that I made already um, some time ago a video that I think got <laughs> the least views of all. That was essentially about this. It was called like the autonomization of of Carolingian local powers. Kind of got like two views. Now, there are certain videos of mine that are, in spite of the channel's young, is that are, they're already in the range of hundreds of views. And and that, looking at this poor video, uh, I've, I've got even this uh, Carolingian warrior in here that is kind of sitting there, like saying, oh, why does nobody watch my, uh, my, <laughs> my video in here? It kind of uh, saddens me because... Uh, I realize most of you are not interested in this. I mean, as long as I talk about military history, I immediately get lots of views. Of everybody wants to know about the Crusades, and everybody wants to know about, you know, the tactics and battles and all this stuff, which I love myself, because if anything, if I can fit in any job uh, standard, that would be military historian. Uh, at least I try. Uh, so I, I perfectly understand why people are attracted by that, but really, um, also these chapters are important. I'm not kidding. Uh, I mean, why should I? But in the first place, I, I, I mean, I'm not just saying it to, to for you to watch my videos. It's really for you to understand that part of history, or at least to discuss it together with me, because that is... Um, where everything began in by certain standards and it um, and it's important not just to understand those times but in fact the consequences you know uh, there is this I don't know maybe 
I think in pop culture, and especially in the Anglosphere, I, I noticed this at least that the the, the main attraction is towards um, this late Middle Ages, like for especially especially for the British, I think the Middle Ages is mostly the fifteenth century, so the very end of it. In other countries, it's different. Uh, I must say, also in the Anglosphere, there is a lot of renewed interest for the so-called Dark Ages. They're sometimes in there called like the World Middle Ages, but I'm talking about the Migration Era, essentially. About which I'm also passionate, made a lot of videos recently. Uh, so, it's as if, but, you know, in pop culture in general, in, in let's say, in, in, in the world Western world, um, the idea of the Middle Ages is where, you know, there are already big castles and plate armor, so basically at the very end of the Middle Ages. Wh what about the core? What about the heart of the Middle Ages? The High Middle Ages? So this area between the area, I mean, this moment between, the, say, the, the 9th and the the 12th century. And that That is a kind of a very, very, very important thing. In fact, I realized there, uh, uh, I realized there is a, this vacuum People are increasingly interested either either about the lower Middle Ages or about the migration era. What's what lays in the middle? Nobody cares <laughs> really, and instead, I think it deserves way more credit. And uh, and I don't know, I don't know if this is partly coming from certain national historiographies. I mean, this idea that before I don't know before the Battle of Hastings, there was nothing ha important <laughs> happening to the Middle Ages, um, uh, or that I don't know th those centuries are just a, a dark hole where nothing happened. And I'm I'm trying to I I on on Schwerpunkt to make actually a lot. To of if I'm making a lot of effort at least to try to spread awareness on 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 these other periods because I <laughs> I don't know I think history is you know when when the, when the uh, there is an overlooked part part of history especially when it's actually more important even than other things that are instead more um, praised let's say or appreciated I always say. Well, I always sense get uh, get a sense of emotion, and um, I don't know. I say, but why that poor part of history doesn't get credit? Um, and and I don't really understand, and I feel the need to talk about it because we all come from there, by the way. Uh, this is also in our thinking uh, way of thinking. It if you you wonder why shouldn't an Arab be studied? Yes, of course, it, those, those were, yeah, the, the, even the genetical descendants from those people, who people would say, who cares? It was like tens of generations ago when people have practically nothing to do with. Um, uh, yeah, but it's still where you come from, at least from a cultural point of view. So you can't understand the Middle Ages if you think you can erase a part of it or a geographical area of it because it doesn't make sense. There is also this idea that, I don't know, and I realize it, that's probably mo the most negative thing. And people study, many people really, study the Middle Ages because of political reasons uh, implying that, I don't know, back in the Middle Ages we were so our strong uh, uh, communitary identity where nobody touched us, we were so pure and free and all this, this is complete uh, rubbish, of course. And you understand why so many people in this sense exclude other spaces and times of history at that point, because they it's not that they care about history, they just care about that concept. That comes together, by the way, not by even praising the history of of that part they're interested in, but because they practically know nothing about it in the first place for reasoning in such a fashion, and therefore even not giving any good remembrance to, to actually how those people really were. And uh, and I talk about Middle Ages, of course I do it more s mostly for utilitarian uh, reasons, because that's, you know, I've been at least learning about them now for 
several years, which obviously doesn't makes doesn't make me anything uh, incredibly, um, you know, uh, expert or precise or reliable on because you know history is so based you can't basically um, pretend to to teach something like the Middle Ages, right? But saying that <laughs> at least it comes easier for me to talk longer about it. Uh, and and I think that adding, you know, this story of the Middle Ages step by step will one day, if I will make enough videos, maybe rise, uh, uh, raise a, a bit more of um, of sensitivity for, for the period and trying to understand it from these bases. Because frankly, on, on, on you know, if I Google topics like the one of today, I find nothing on the internet. Now, that is pretty serious um, in my opinion because, you know, in the internet there, there is uh, the huge, uh, uh, you know, there is um, like 60 worlds <laughs> in here is a huge amount of the, the most stupid things imaginable and such important things, maybe people have not even n neither conceived them. And these are things, by the way, that are written in history books. It's not me who is I'm just just making disclosure. I'm just telling what it, what I read basically. So these are all things that in our civilization were studied, also pretty extensively. There, there have been oceans of ink written, but the internet doesn't show that. So I'm here essentially to to fill that that empty space, trying and hoping at least that someone will get interested on. So. Every time you see these strange titles like uh, the autonomization of post carolingian powers, like in that poor video that nobody watches, <laughs> do not think it's oh usually usually boring stuff about yeah the, the this time this foggy time nobody cares about um, because it's really you if you if you get into it you discover it's a world world and it was it, it was so uh, vi say a fervent, so dynamic, so you know this other thing of the Dark Ages. What well, what are the Dark Ages? Let's be serious about it. D they have no, you know, it doesn't make sense. You, I noticed that you sometimes I get some comment either in here on Facebook where I share uh, videos, and I get this. I completely get from from what certain people write that they they don't have an idea that the Middle Ages is something dynamic. And I think it's a flat, uh, ignorant place where people knew nothing, when they just were looking at their own uh, tiny uh, piece of land, and that's it. And the, the civilization has one of the most uh, de one of the most vivacious um, developments, one of the greatest lust for knowledge, uh, some of the greatest um, mechanical intelligence and scientific interest you can ever find the universe is, uh, is uh, excuse me the middle ages is a universe on its own and so let's try to know it better let's let's start to 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 care about the middle ages hmm? where today i just Today I'm talking excessively much because <laughs> I've yesterday I found a way to to elaborate these videos in a a much shorter time. Uh, like before, I had to wait for even hours. And now it happens in like ten seconds, so <laughs> so <laughs> I'm wasting time. But still, well, I, I was not kidding. I think uh, just think about it if you've never done it because uh, it's normal. I think for if you are raised into to the Western world today, that to have such prejudices in f towards the Middle Ages, let's be honest about it. it it's obvious these are not things that are taught well at school. Uh, sometimes they are not even taught at all, and uh, very few people study such well humanities in general, but these these periods in particular and. Um, or at least have a very narrow perspective on it that is open even by other people. So sometimes I um, 
you know, going around in, on vacations, um, I came across into, I don't know, these historical places, uh, sometimes hearing on the distance what, what guides were telling tourists. I mean, uh, <laughs> You know, if if you teach history that way, that's pretty bad. <laughs> You're not m gonna make people interested or aware about it. And on the contrary, I must say this: that I've met also a lot of people around that are actually genuinely history um, interested about, even from a strictly historical point of view, on the Middle Ages. Make a lot of questions that are also very. Sometimes they're very naive, but they're at least they're very di straightforward. They are very because they really want, especially Americans. I, f I find that Americans are extremely interested about the Middle Ages. They appreciate it a lot, want to know m a lot about it. Um, so I, I realize, by the way, most of my audience is is come is uh, from the U.S. It's something pretty interesting, I think, because um, I think that such an important country like the U.S. has feels culturally these interest, this sensitivity for that period, and I'm and I hope in my with my little, you know. Channel to to try to to do a bit of that to try to to answer certain questions. I don't put myself onto a onto a uh, of a uh, from a pulpit and kind of making lessons to anyone. On the contrary, my my I think my videos are just pretty uh, smooth talks, uh, dialogues, and discussion chats, uh, how you want to call them. And um, and I think my objective, I said it many times, my objective is to give you a food for thought. Okay, so you can't disagree uh, f uh, fullest what I say. I, I make mistakes every time. But as long as I give you that tiny bit, you know, to know about, uh, to think about history, maybe a different perspective that makes you, you know, that triggers some criticism, I think I, I have my goal there. And I think we can work this together. And uh, I'm see, I'm seeing right now that I have some followers that appreciate, uh, especially medieval history, and that is very very important for me. And uh, I hope I will I won't I won't disappoint you in many ways. Uh, so my advice is just not just to to look at my videos. Uh, <laughs> If you really have to do something about it, uh, buy a history book and, 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 and read it. If you have time, start it. Um, that's how it starts. Uh, there are no other ways. It, it, it began for me as well. I was extremely ignorant about the Middle Ages before starting them. Uh, at least I was a bit interested in, in them, but sh surely it wasn't that... Uh, and such, I, I still suffered of those prejudices. In spite of loving the Middle Ages, this is something that happens as well. That people think of the Dark Ages generally, even if they like them, as something dark. And this is kind of an ex uh, a paradox, but uh, that tells how really complicated our relationship with the Middle Ages still is, and wh why ha we have to to set things right, <laughs> even from from that point of view. So this is it. And sorry for the ramble. I know that probably you're not interested in my thoughts and you just want sheer facts <laughs> uh, that I also deliver with great difficulty when I when I try to do <laughs> to do that. But whatever. I hope in spite of all, let's say, that you liked this video and that uh, if you did, please share it um, if anything, because that pushes me to do more. Because the more people watch this, and the better I, uh, you know, the more scruples am <laughs> I make to myself, and and the less uh, and I, I I waste myself into rambles like this. By the way, and uh, otherwise leave a like or a dislike if I deserve a dislike, and um, um, or or subscribe to my channel if you. If you're so passionate about it that you want to receive notifications from uh, at every upcoming video, and for now, um, I thank you heartily as always for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.